So Mount Kilimanjaro, why climb it? Uh, my name's Ian Redmond, I'm a biologist. Uh, I specialise in apes and elephants, neither of which climb to the top of Kilimanjaro. But the story for me began on a beach in Bali in Indonesia. Uh, in 2007, the United Nations held their climate talks in Bali, and for the first time, the UN included the concept of tropical forest conservation in the efforts to stabilise the climate. And I was there with the UN Great Ape Survival Partnership, pushing the idea that forests are not just trees. The apes, the elephants, the other species are part of that picture. While I was there, I met an old friend from the hall, Ian Singleton. He, he speaks up for Sumatran orangutans. And he introduced me to another lad from all, Andy Steele, who works in Thailand and plants trees. So there we were on a beach in Bali, three lads from all, thinking, well, what can we do to raise the profile of climate change? And eventually that led to us going up Kilimanjaro. Why Kili? Well, look at it. It's a beacon for climate change. When this picture was taken back in 1980, the summit of Kilimanjaro was almost covered in deep glaciers. Now, occasionally there's a smattering of snow, but most of the glaciers have gone. And whereas you used to have to use crampons and hike for hours in, in Arctic-like conditions to get to the summit, uh, now you can just walk up in boots and you're passing the remnants of the glaciers, but they're almost gone. So this film is to explain the importance of individual action, not just government action, individual action to prevent climate change, and to explore some of the impacts of it and the need to integrate wildlife conservation throughout the world, but especially in the tropical forests, to achieve that goal. Coming up with a snow covered top is Mount Kilimanjaro. And we will shortly commence the descent into Kili. And uh, halfway in the descent on the right hand side of the aircraft will be Mount Meru. We estimate touching down at uh, 20 minutes past nine local time. So we've just started our climb up Kili and we're walking through some pine forestry in this field with uh, cabbages. And it's just being uh, raided by two species of monkey, the black and white colobus, which is the Kilimanjaro subspecies, and what looks like a local variant of the Sykes monkey. Um, very similar almost to the golden monkey of the Virungas, but definitely uh, one of the same group of, of the blue monkey. Uh, Secopithecus mitis have different forms. The colobus monkey being a leaf eater is eating the cabbage leaves, and the um, Sykes monkey being uh, more of an omnivore is digging up roots, presumably potatoes or some root vegetable that um, the farmer is losing to uh, this mixed troop of crop raiding primates. Yeah, 
Won't have that every day. Oh, <laughs> not my cup of tea. Then, so sorry. No, no, it's don't not my cup of tea. No, tea. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my cup of tea. This is um, what in Swahili is called Maziwalala, which means uh, milk that's slept. It's, it's like uh, a liquid yogurt. Um, in India, they call it um, <laughs> call it lassi. Um, it's very good. You can, put, you can put sugar in it, make it sweeter, but this is just au nature. Very good. I would call myself a reluctant conservationist. By birth, I was a naturalist. Just grew up being fascinated by all life forms. And so I went to university to study biology, so I'm a biologist by training, and I'm a conservationist by necessity. Because every time I start to study something, it seems that someone else comes along and kills the animal that I'm studying because someone somewhere in the world wants to buy a bit of it. I was born in Malaya, but was brought up in Beverley in Yorkshire, and then spent my teenage years in Hull. After university, I had the incredible good fortune to go and work as Diane Foss's research assistant, studying and then protecting the mountain gorillas of Rwanda and Uganda and the DRC, or as it then was, Zaire. I then went on to study elephants uh, that go into caves on Mount Elgin in Kenya. And when poachers killed some of my study animals, I tried to get organisations to work together and set up a coalition to help protect elephants. This was the African Ellie Fund and the Ellie Friends campaign that helped achieve the ivory ban in 1989. I then asked all the organisations that worked with uh, apes to get together and collaborate, and that became the Ape Alliance. And for nearly 20 years now, that alliance has grown to nearly 100 organisations around the world working to protect and conserve and where in captivity give a decent quality of life for all apes. Why would a biologist climb to the top of a mountain which is so high that living things don't go there apart from mountaineers? Uh, it's twice as high as the mountains that I've worked on before and uh, it also has glaciers on top. Now I have visited glaciers in other parts of the world but they are receding. And what's fascinating about Kilimanjaro is that the ice has been receding for, for decades, long before uh, the current concern about climate change. There has been that, that receding. Now, it, it might be correlated with the Industrial Revolution and increasing CO2 emissions, um, but there may be other factors, or it's more likely a combination of many factors. So what, when we talk about climate change, it's not just simply that average global temperatures are going up, therefore the ice is melting. That is certainly a factor, but it's also how much precipitation is coming onto the mountain. On the top of Kilimanjaro, it snows. The, the air is so cold at, at 19,000 feet that water freezes, and yet the glaciers are getting smaller. So there's less precipitation and more sublimation. That's the uh, sun burning off the ice directly, going straight from ice to water vapour, and not just on Kilimanjaro, but all over the world, uh, wherever you have glaciers in mountains, you look at the photographs, they're receding, and it won't be long before many of these glaciers are gone completely, and the polar ice caps are melting, and all this water that was locked up in ice is now going into the sea, so sea levels are rising. And that's one of the frightening things about conservation today, is you know, during the 40-odd the years that I've been involved with conservation, the focus has been on anti-poaching, protecting habitat, things on the ground. But we're faced with climate change, and that brings a whole new set of problems. Because you can have the best protected forest in the world, and where the gorillas live and where the Mount Elgin elephants live, they're pretty protected. But if it stops raining, then we've got a problem. So climate change isn't just about global warming, it's about shifting weather patterns and the impact that will have on the vegetation and therefore on the species. And Kilimanjaro, because of its receding glaciers, has become like a beacon for climate change in Africa. It's the highest freestanding mountain in the world. It's a, a challenge that thousands of people every year take on. But we're doing it not just for the personal challenge, but to make this documentary, to get across to people how important 
action on climate change is. It's the morning at the first camp of Mount Kilimanjaro. And outside I pretend to be greeted by a pile of vomit. And here is the author <laughs> of this. Yeah. Dr. Um, Singleton, would you like to explain yourself? Yeah, I guess I'm the first casualty. Yeah? The, I saw, uh, yeah, I went to bed early and slept around six, seven hours really well, and then woke up a few hot and cold flushes, and then thought there's something wrong with my stomach, and then went to sleep again, and then woke up and thought there's something really wrong with my stomach, get that zip open, and, and just managed to get my head out the door and screw up. But luckily managed to miss your sandals and my boots and everything else. Let's see how today goes, but at the moment I feel okay. I'm Ian Singleton. I work on a thing called the Sumatran Orangutan Conservation Program, normally based in Medan in Sumatra in Indonesia. But here I am on the slopes of uh, Mount Kilimanjaro in Africa and getting ready to climb to the highest point on the whole continent of Africa. Dr. Ian Singleton is the authority on Sumatra's orangutans. He grew up in Hull and then went to work in zoos. His love of wildlife led him to Whipsnade and Edinburgh zoos. Then in 1989, he went to Jersey as their orangutan keeper. He took vacations in Indonesia to learn about orangutans in the wild and eventually went on to do a PhD, which started in 1996 in South Aceh in Sumatra and finished in late 2000. He then began to work with Panico, a Swiss NGO that is working to save the Sumatran orangutan. He is now the director of all aspects of the Sumatran orangutan conservation program. This involves quite a lot of office work and meetings, but he gets into the forest and is a very hands-on sort of guy. Rescuing orangutans from uh, palm oil plantations, from forest fires. He looks after orangutans as long as they need it, but as soon as they're able, he puts them back in the forest. With his Indonesian colleagues, they are making a real difference to the survival of Sumatra's orangutans. And Sumatra's orangutans make a real difference to the health of the forest in Sumatra. Orangutan conservation and climate change are inseparable. But you could say that about anything, really. Um, Indonesia is the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases, basically carbon dioxide. But unlike the USA and China, whose emissions are based on burning of fossil fuels, Indonesia's emissions are based on chopping down, burning of forests and peatlands. Which, as we speak, are being cleared for palm oil plantations. Now, the highest densities of orangutans in the world are found in the peatlands. I mean, peat is essentially, um, you know, flooded, flooded areas or flooded forests and all the branches and leaves and twigs that fall off the trees and the trees themselves when they fall down they end up under water where there's no free oxygen it's what they call anaerobic conditions and so they don't rot and over thousands and thousands if not hundreds of thousands of years the peat accumulates and it is essentially just pure carbon and some of these forests the peat can be you know eight nine ten meters or more thick so just imagine how many millions and millions of tons of carbon is locked up in these peatlands below the ground. But this is also the areas where the highest densities of orangutans are found. Your average density of orangutans in normal mineral soils is like one, maybe two if you're lucky, per square kilometer. Whereas in some of the peatlands, especially in Sumatra, the densities can reach seven or even eight individuals per square kilometre. So the peatlands of Sumatra have rightly been called kind of the orangutan capital of the world for many, many reasons. But every time these forests are cleared and burnt, all that carbon is just released into the atmosphere. Now, Indonesia has 56% of the world's tropical peat forests. And the experts have predicted that locked up in these, in these areas is around four to 16 times the amount of carbon 
that is currently in the atmosphere today. So destroying these forests, these peatland forests, has major, major global impacts. It's not just about chopping down a few trees, losing a few monkeys or a few bird species. This is, this, this, the loss of these forests has major, major impacts for everybody on the planet. We're off to try and find the camera trap that Ian and Andy went to set. I left them once we reached the bridge back at the turning towards We're the We're trying top. to find it. So we're going to try and find it. Do, not do, no try. Oh! <laughs> Luke is trying to use the force uh. and Yoda is teaching him. He says, I'm trying. And Yoda says, do, not do, no try. <laughs> you either do it or you don't do it. All this, I'm trying. We will find the camera trap, <laughs> yeah. and we will get some because footage. Because we know exactly where we put it. <laughs> yes, exactly. So we just picked up the camera trap from that boulder there, and see that just down here, there are some nice uh, hoof marks. It looks a bit small for a bush buck, most likely a diker. So with any luck, the camera trap will record its passage. Unfortunately, it hadn't. Come on, come on, as we are always ready. Steady, rocking. We'll fight and we'll conquer again and again. You're going to fall in now? No. <laughs> it's happening. You're not stuck in an office in Bangkok. I nearly fell in then. <laughs> I'm Andy Steele, uh, founder of the Pat Foundation and a person responsible for organising this trip and getting the guys to come along and join us on this uh, Climb for Change in 2014. Andy Steele was also born in Hull. He grew up there and when he left school he joined the Navy. After 13 years distinguished service in the Royal Navy, he moved to Thailand. In Thailand, he's founder of a charity called the Pat Foundation, Plant a Tree Today Foundation, which is a very practical response to what individuals can do to prevent dangerous climate change. And his charity, the Pat Foundation, was the proud recipient of the United Nations Seed Award in 2009, and it's supporting ongoing reforestation efforts globally. And he wants to help combat climate change and deforestation, and is helping local communities fight poverty and those communities are reliant on the sustainability of these ecosystems that he's restoring. For me, there's a couple of reasons for climbing. Uh, one's a personal challenge. I've got a ceramic hip that was put in last August, so not so long ago. Uh, a knee that needs replacing. I had a motocross accident and ripped all the tendons in my shoulders. So uh, the fact that I'm accomplishing it is... Uh, achievement in itself. Uh, there's obviously more profound reasons for doing this. Um, you know, I'm a father, I've got kids, and it means a lot to me to step up and do something for climate change and take action against climate change because it's not the planet that we inhabit now that we should be concerned about. It's the, it's the future generations that are going to inherit what we leave. And that's what's important for me is ensuring that we focus on environmental education, and that's one of the things Pat's aiming to do and raise money for is an environmental education portal so we can teach the future leaders of industry and possibly leaders of countries about these environmental problems and what, what they should be doing to tackle them. And that's one of the reasons thing also that has motivated Dr. Ian Singleton, Dr. Redmond and Abby to join this climb, because they're conservationists at heart and professionals in their own field but they they have a strong desire and will to take action isn't it amazing how we, in the two days that we've been climbing so far that the topography is so different and the vegetation it's amazing so so diverse in just such a short, short space of time this really is a contrast to the cloud range, the cloud forest region. Yeah. And monkeys here. No, but possibly buffalo. Yes, the signs. Aren't 
But nothing goes above like shoulder head height. The shrubs here. No. The clouds are rolling in. Mm. And we've lost Dr. Redmond am amongst the rough. He's gone. There's a little freestanding water here. I think there's a lot more water under the gravel, but there's a bit on the surface here, and there's fresh tracks there. Of of the other species. As they come in here to drink, I'll put my camera trap here in tonight. And you then look, you? we'll get some uh, film of whatever species we're utilising this. Yeah. Let's just see. Once again, however, the camera trap recorded nothing. The sad state of affairs, really, when you think about it. The snow caps on the top are going to be gone in the next six, ten years, never to be seen again. And whatever you do in terms of reducing the effects of climate change, these, uh, these glaciers are going to go. But because it's not in the mainstream media, it's not been, I don't want to say rammed down people's throats, but it's not at the forefront of people's minds. And people do forget, you know, just little things you can do, like unplugging your electrical appliances, not leaving your phone charger in the wall. In terms of the environment, it's not just climate change, I mean, simple things can be done. And we, we don't realize, you know, you jump in the shower and you leave it running, for minutes and it's nice to have a hot warm shower you know we could do one now to be honest with you but really you could quite simply get in get wet turn the shower off lather up and then once you're all done rinse yourself off you probably use about 20 percent of the water that um that you'd normally use taking a full-blown shower or a bath and uh brushing your teeth is a simple thing as well how many people literally Turn the tap on, brush the teeth, leave the tap running, and then uh, and then turn it off when they're finished. And you don't really need to do that, do you? I was sleeping like a baby, and then um, I hear Ian's voice, and he's like, "Abby, are you awake?" And then I step outside, and this is what I'm greeted with. That's everything I ever thought Kilimanjaro would show me. We're officially above the clouds. <laughs> That's amazing. And the sun is just rising over there. To the east. I'm Abby Barnes. I'm 18 years old and I've just finished my A-level exams. And now, can you believe it, I'm on the slopes of Kilimanjaro in Africa. Abby Barnes is a semi-professional filmmaker specialising in promotional shorts and wildlife conservation and expedition style films. When she joined the expedition to climb Kilimanjaro, Abby had just finished her A-levels, but despite her youth, is already an award-winning filmmaker and she set up a production company called Song Thrush Productions. Originally she was joining us on the climb as an assistant camera person but unfortunately, the cameraman who was coming pulled out, so Abby ended up making the whole film. And what you see is very much a product of her expertise. Abby's passion for the outdoors began during her childhood, and she soon established herself as a long-distance backpacker. She's a traditional archer, trail runner, climber, rower, and scuba diver. She's a trained mountain leader. Kilimanjaro is her biggest challenge yet. Climate change is something that's happening now. It's not something that's going to happen in the future. I mean, you turn on the news and you see about all of these different storm patterns and the, the highest recorded temperature and the lowest recorded temperature. And that's a repeating scenario year after year after year. And maybe we enjoy the sun and maybe we enjoy the cool, but actually we need to take a look at the patterns that are actually occurring and be like, hang on, something is going on here. And it's not something that's going to happen in the future, it's something that's happening now. And if we don't take responsibility for, for the things that are happening now, it's going to be too late. All too often we do focus on the impacts of climate change on the human environment. We focus on agriculture and, and productivity and all of these different things. But we need to take a closer look at the effect on the ecosystems that function around us and the 
the impact of climate change on those because we rely on those ecosystems. I'm climbing this mountain to show that you don't have to climb a mountain to combat climate change. You just need to make those small changes in your day-to-day -day life. And everybody needs to make those small changes. We woke up this morning, it's really nice and sunny. It was so nice to sort of look at the door of the tent and see beams of sunlight coming in. But um, it's, it's warming up now as well. There was frost on the floor at the beginning, but now we can actually see uh, where we're going. I mean, that's Kibo Peak behind me, I think. I think today we walk around uh, around the bottom of that and then ready to start going up it tomorrow. And then once you get up to the top there, you've got another sort of half day or night times hike to get to the Uhuru Peak. But the interesting thing is that you can already see there's hardly any snow up there. You look at pictures of Kilimanjaro from the 70s and 80s and probably the 90s as well. Uh, most of that hill, if not 100% of it, would have been covered in snow. And uh, you can see it's almost gone already. And um, sitting here in the nice sunlight, thinking about taking my fleece off and wearing a t-shirt again, you can see, you can sort of get the idea why. Megson, how many years have you been coming to Kilimanjaro? I have been working, I have been working here for more than 22 years. And, and right now we're looking, there's only a little bit of glacier on the left and a little bit on the top at the right. Yeah. Um, when you first came here 22 years ago, yeah. um, what, was this, what was the glacier cover like? The half of the mountain was enveloped by the glacier, but today there's no enough glacier because of the global warming. The snow we saw early this morning mm -hmm. has already gone, but all around the mountain, mm -hmm. There are farms and villages that depend on the glacier-fed streams. But the shortage of water is going to cause real hardship. Yeah, it's because of the global warming. And uh, every day there's change, change, day to day, day to day, because of the, the snow is continuing to melt. It's diminishing completely. So people who had very little to do with causing global warming mm -hmm. are the ones who are suffering from it. True. You'd think that a mountain as well trod as Kilimanjaro would have been well explored, but our next uh, encounter with a bit of geology was a great surprise because it wasn't in any of the guidebooks or any, any of the maps we'd seen. That's because it was only discovered recently. We stopped to do a little bit of high altitude spelunking. So I've just come up that um, passageway. There's rock fall in the middle, but the cave itself is about uh, 15 feet wide, 5, 10, 15, 20 feet wide in places. There's a little bit of flowstone coming through the ceiling, some dissolved minerals that are forming little stalactites, but the cave itself is almost certainly a lava tube as we're on Kilimanjaro, which is a volcano. And uh, it's beyond the limits of my night vision. So we can't do very much cave photography. Let's see if we can go back down and join the others. Yeah, nice. Amazing. Dr. Singleton, give me an impression of underground Kilimanjaro. Um, it's... The temperature is reasonable, exactly like you said. I'm amazed it doesn't smell of bat guano and there's no sign of any bats. But maybe that's because there's no kind of insects outside to eat, but bats fly a long way, so I'm, quite, I'm still quite surprised about that. Maybe there's some other reason. Mm -hmm. This is interesting too. Uh, we're not very far underground, but this is pretty solid rock, and uh, yet the plankton's are still getting through. Very nice. Now, 
Wakempu wamepita Hakuna matata Na lemuru wamesaini Hakuna matata Sekandi tumelala Hakuna matata Kikelela wamefika Hakuna matata Tanihati watakwenda Hakuna matata Naziwa wataliona Hakuna matata Kibo watakwenda Hakuna matata Uhuru watafika Hakuna matata Jambo Jambo kwana Habaritani Nzuri sana Wageni Wakaribisho Kili manjaro Hakuna matata Fantastic, the clouds just revealing the, the jagged summit of Moenzi. I guess it's the most spectacular of the three volcanoes that make up the Kilimanjaro Massif. But you don't always see it like that, usually it's just white. What you see here is Animal Corridor. Very nice. Yeah. See the tracks going on. This would be a good place to put the camera trap. The camera ah. trap. It's very long way. Yeah, it's even further. To the old campsite where the camera trap still is. What? No, I'm sorry, I have to run back there and forget it. It's at the other campsite. <laughs> so, seriously? Really? Yeah. Okay. Um, could I pose on one of you guys to carry this? I'll just take my camera and some water and I'll catch you up. Okay. It's a simple trail. Can't get lost. Yeah. I'll, really go. Left the camera truck yeah. I'll go with you in. If you want the exercise, but I don't mind. Oh, quick, quick, quick way to get down, Elian. Jog it down. Years ago, I did the Caramo International Mountain Marathon. Walk uphill, run downhill. I think we better. Another marker because it's hard to follow the trail on this rock, so just to make sure that, that Ian and Andy can find their way across down to the next trail when they come. I'm not very good at this. They should be able to see it there. Oh, what a different sight that, that is. <laughs> Nobody here. Just, Just the ravens picking up the scraps. <laughs> so we just come from 13,000 feet to yeah, a bit below 12,000 feet, and the time of arrival is 12:13. Right, I'll get the time when we get back up. I think we made pretty good time considering we yomped it back, screed running all the way. A lot quicker coming back than going up. Yeah, it works. It's quite desolate actually, considering there was a couple of groups here this morning. Right, let's go find this camera. Now, the camera trap that had been left all morning actually had some of the most interesting bits of video that we got on the whole trip. First of all, there was this white-naped raven that decided to investigate this strange object and peck the camera trap. Then a little while later, a mongoose came out of the bushes and was foraging around in front of it. Not quite perfectly placed, but very nice to see a mongoose at this altitude. Just had news. Ian and Andy are just over there. 
So then they can see me. <laughs> they've done really well, they've made really good time. <laughs> the track all the way down and all the way back up. So they've done twice as far as everybody else. That is impressive stuff. Credit to them. To hinder that, still to assure that the whole area of Kilimanjaro yeah, will recover before. Yeah. yeah. Take only photos yeah. and leave only footprints. Take only photos, yeah. Is why I'm not allowed to shoot you. I've been following your footprints and yeah. yeah. most impressed by how far you've come while I, I considered, was doing my... I considered, you know. I considered branching it out into three different directions to confuse you. <laughs> I know what Abby's boots I thought we like. should have gone like this. And, uh, and uh, I've been following those tracks mostly. Um, but I time. was wondering if the other party might have come up a different route <laughs> and had I'm similar boots. Way. <laughs> that, that's the one thing. Well, we're in this beautiful town at 13,000. 750 feet and all people can think of doing is writing their name in rocks on the beach of the town so as you stroll around you get to see who's been here So it's the evening of nightfall and um, just come into my tent from having tea and I feel like trash. <laughs> I've just taken two ibuprofen um, for a headache which felt more like a migraine. Uh, a stomach that's going absolutely nuts and I just feel really faint. I've had a bit of a headache all day but the problem is when you're filming you just kind of forget to drink because you're always focused on on filming and when people stop to drink you're filming them drinking as opposed to drinking you yourself so I think I've learned a bit of a lesson there uh, I'm still not on the Diamox altitude sickness um, meds and stuff but if uh, these symptoms persist into tomorrow I'll definitely consider taking it because I, I really want to reach that summit it, it means so much to me <laughs> Well, it's the morning of day five. We're heading up to Kibo Hut and I'm alive. <laughs> I survived the night. I felt really rotten, but good old Uncle Ian came and saved me, <laughs> which I'm very grateful for his company. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> he looked after me during the night. <laughs> but, yes. Yeah. <laughs> we made it. We didn't get much sleep, mm. but made it without vomiting too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> nothing, nothing worse than having your patient vomit in a tent. <laughs> <laughs> but the pounding headache's gone now, which I'm really, really grateful for. And we're all just trying to keep warm and we're ready to go, I think. Okay, so we're about an hour in. It's been pretty steady so far, but uh, I think... Oh, well, I was going to say you could see where we're going. <laughs> And it started to reveal, the mountain started to reveal itself and we can see what's ahead of us. And a uh, pretty steady jaunt going into camp. So a few more hours yet. And then we'll get ready for the summit. Just working out. Uh, if zero is 12, we're at 13. Oh, we're actually a bit below, we're at 13,750. Pretty much the same as where we slept. We climbed a bit and then we dropped a bit and now we've climbed again. If anyone's ever added up the cumulative climb of Kilimanjaro, <laughs> you add together all the ups and downs, you're much higher than 19 and a half. I'm sure. The mood really changed as we approached these strange white objects that we were starting to see in the distance on the saddle between Mawenzi and Kibo. As we approached, we realised there were bits of fuselage and wing of a crashed aeroplane. 
a light aircraft um, hit the mountain here in 2008, killing four Italian tourists. Only the, the pilots survived. But it was really a, a strange feeling to look at the remains of this tragic accident. It seems that the, uh, the remains of the aircraft have been left here as a kind of memorial to the tourists who lost their lives in such a sad way. And here is the Klein McKilly kitchen tent. Chef, chef at work. Chef, tell, tell me your name. Edward. My name Edward. Is Edward. Edward. Yeah. Edward goes by the title of the stomach engineer, and he's doing his engineering, doing tomato toasty sandwiches in a frying pan and 15,000 feet above sea level. You're a master of your art, sir. This is the last pit stop before we attempt to go up the hill. I think from here it starts to look a bit steep actually. So we've got a bit of work to do tomorrow to get to the top. I reckon four or five hours to get to Gilman's Point and then another hour to get to the Horu Peak. So six hours work and then about two hours down. Here we are in our tent at the end of the afternoon and it's not often I admit to having an afternoon nap but this afternoon we uh, we turned in. The yes. sun was out, the tent was warm, we had our first warm sleep, deep sleep for many nights and that's really good because tonight we've got to get up at um, some ungodly hour of the night to start climbing at one o'clock in the morning to get up to um, Gilman's Point at sunrise. So what are your thoughts, Dr. Singleton? I agree, this is the warmest, most comfortable I've been on the entire trip. But um, yeah, things could change, but I'm so pleased that you know you see all these things on YouTube and everything, reports about how people feel awful at this stage. And I mean, Abby's not feeling very well, but um, I'm happy to get here and feel as fit as, as fit as ever. I really, really you know, feel fine and ready to go. <laughs> but despite a, a, a rocky start on day one, I'm uh, thrilled to get to this stage and not be sat here thinking this is the worst night of my life, at least so far. Anyway. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> of course, can change. at the moment there's still a bit of sunshine, but as yeah. soon as that sun goes down, we're, we're at uh, what, above 15,000 feet above sea level here, so... Uh, as soon as the sun goes down or goes behind a cloud, the bitterly cold wind rips the heat from your body. And instead of lying in a sleeping bag with not much on, we'll be uh, putting as many T-shirts and thermal undergarments that we've got yeah. for that for that few but hours. I'm also surprised as well. I mean, just walking up here, it's, you really are not seeing much ice. Oh, we've seen right now, there's two tiny little blobs. One at one end and one yes. or two thirds of the way across. I don't know what we're going to find tomorrow, but these stories about the ice disappearing from Kilimanjaro look absolutely true from what I've seen. So yes, now. it's yeah. going to be quite a... a bit depressing in many ways. Indeed. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it was interesting to see a little bit of snowfall um, the other day when we had drizzle and rain. Yeah, there was a smattering of snow mm -hmm. all on this side, this it's face gone, of... It's gone by completely, lunchtime. Completely right? gone. Completely gone. So... It still snows, but then it melts the next day. And the glaciers are just getting smaller and smaller. And that's what we're here to document and to, to discuss the impact that that has on our work um, in conserving gorillas or with Ian's work conserving yeah. orangutans. I haven't spent a day freezing cold. I've been sat in sweating buckets and worried about sunburn. <laughs> yes. Well, so it's a learning experience, and hopefully we can uh, make some useful comments as to what people can do to try and avert the disaster that we seem to be hurtling towards in terms of 
climate change and extreme weather and uh, rising sea levels and melting glaciers and um, thawing permafrosts. Okay, so it's just gone 11, and Gusto has woken us all up. Um, broken sleep for most of us, but thank goodness my headache has pretty much disappeared. Hurrah! I know, that is really worth celebrating, I'm over the moon about that. And so we're having a last minute cup of tea and biscuits before heading off to try to reach Gilman's Point for sunrise, which is five hours away. It turns out that the secret of success of climbing high mountains is to do everything very slowly. So we found ourselves almost literally doing fairy steps up the side of Kilimanjaro in slow motion. People had head torches on and as you looked at the mountain you could see little rows of people in groups. They looked for all the world like sort of bioluminescent caterpillars. Every so often if you were unlucky you might have to go down the mountain and these are the people who, whose bodies did not adapt well to high altitude. The night went on and on and on. And we got to Gilman's Point uh, just before dawn, which meant that having crossed the crater area past the glaciers, we were approaching Uhuru Peak literally as the sun was rising. I was filming it because it was such a momentous occasion for all of the group, but I couldn't quite understand why I was weeping. I was trying to clear my eyes to focus on, on the, the scene and, and frame the camera. And it was just so emotional and I wasn't expecting that at all it took me quite by surprise that um, reaching the, the highest point in Africa and seeing the sunrise and experiencing a sight that normally you only see out of an aeroplane window and you see that amazing deep velvet blue sky a black sky with stars and then on the horizon the colors of dawn and here we were seeing exactly that same image but not through a little aircraft window uh, looking all around. It was a full 360 experience, which was quite literally overwhelming. Queuing for our turn to take a photograph of the sign at the summit of Uhuru Peak and asked this uh, couple what they thought about it. And to my pleasant surprise, not only did they explain that it was to celebrate a 50th birthday, but also their concerns about climate change. Excuse me, would you like to say something to this camera about what this means to you and why you came here? Well, it's Philippe's 50th birthday. So we decided to celebrate it by taking it all the way to the top. <laughs> and we did it today, so it's amazing. It's really, really exciting. I wish that whatever we see here will stay forever and that global warming will not destroy this beautiful nature. But you, you know that <clears throat> the predictions are that the glaciers will be gone within I know, that's why I'm 10, 20 years. And, uh, I really so we're so that, happy uh, to be here and see that. I really that hope that you and can't start to really react and, uh, and take, take, uh, take... We just hope our kids can have the same experience. <laughs> <laughs> it would be great. Now <laughs> <laughs> well, that was an adventure. It was such a big uh, rise in altitude as well. We, I think we've done over a kilometre upwards vertically in, in just four hours and we've all started to get headaches and stuff like that and keen to get back down and hopefully the headaches go away and we get happy and relax but uh, yeah an adventure but certainly not easy not you know, not a stroll in the park this last day um, but glad we did it I mean this is the first time I've ever I've ever really seen glaciers and they're impressive to look at but they ain't very big anymore. You know, there's uh, there's just a few of them, little fragments here of what was once massive, very impressive things, and they're just you know there's not one left, and they'll be gone. It, 
now what you're looking yeah. at actually looks more like a, a cowboy in western well, 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 desert scene. Well, you know, you'd well, expect well, to see well, the Indians well, riding well, over there chasing after the cowboys, wouldn't you? About 20 years ago, on top of this mountain, was covered by the glacier, but today there is no glacier because of the global warming and the people from abroad, they have already come and measured on the top of this mountain. And they said that after 10 years, there will be no more snow on the top of Kilimanjaro. It's almost unthinkable, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so it will be marvelous, you know? Do you, think, do you think that will affect the tourism for people? Uh, it will affect everything. It will affect the rainforest. It will affect the head of the moonland. Because uh, this mountain... is fantastic. A lot of people from everywhere in the world, they'll come and to see this. So, I don't know if you, this is no if you will finish completely, if you plant, they will come again. <laughs> Maybe. It's still a very beautiful place. Yeah, it's still, it is. But it will be changed. The places behind us are amazing. And I think we're fortunate enough to witness them and it's quite an emotional moment to see to see it and in a decade or so people are not going to be able to share that experience and there's nothing that we do today is going to save these glaciers but in terms of global warming and climate change we can make a difference and that's down to everybody it's not down to us climbing this at the highest point in Africa it's down to the viewers people watching this, not to pay lip service, but to actually take action. This um, landscape is a bit out of my comfort zone. Um, there's no wildlife to speak of up here. Um, it's cold and I'm not really a one for climbing mountains because they're there. Um, but the Climb for Climate Action team has come up here to the top of Kilimanjaro um, to make a point. These glaciers are disappearing. Now, when I first flew over Kilimanjaro in the mid-1980s, um, much of this summit was covered with glaciers, and they're going. And this has become a, a beacon for climate change. And it doesn't just affect the people that live around here. It isn't just a, a, an iconic image of Africa, Kilimanjaro with the, with the snowy, glaciers on the summit is disappearing. It's, it's symbolic of what's happening all over. Um, if we don't reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, if we don't protect the tropical forests and the animals that live in them so that they can continue to regulate our climate and generate rainfall for us, then not only will the glaciers go, but so will much of the rainfall in, Southern Africa, in sub -Saharan, sub saharan Africa. The, the climate models suggest that if um, average global temperatures rise by three or four degrees, much of sub-Saharan Africa will be arid. And the people around here who depend on glacier-fed rivers for their agriculture, for their drinking water, won't be getting any because the rain won't be falling. So climate change is something which affects everyone and every species on the planet. So if by climbing Kilimanjaro, at a time when we, the window of opportunity for changing that, nightmare scenario is gradually closing but if we act now we can change it if we can draw people's attention to that then that's what this is all about it affects us it affects the great apes and the elephants and it affects everyone on the planet so climate action has to be now not sometime vaguely in the future when we get around to it modern industrial society has a heavy carbon footprint the power that comes to our homes often comes from fossil fuel power stations. How can we ensure that we use renewable energy rather than fossil fuels? Fortunately, there are ways that you can alter your own individual behavior. You can take action by reducing your own carbon footprint. And by that, I mean use less energy and fewer resources. 
when you buy a new light bulb, ensure you buy either a low energy or better still an LED light bulb. And when you're finished with them, of course, turn them off. When you go to bed, turn off your appliances, not just putting them on standby, but by switching them off at the mains. One little standby light is nothing, but billions of them use a lot of energy. When you're running the tap, be frugal. If you wash your hands, use the cold tap. By turning the hot tap on, you immediately kick your boiler into action, which even if it's just for a few seconds of warm water, it wastes a lot of energy. Similarly, if you turn your thermostat down and put a jumper on, or if you have a fire, use wood rather than coal. Because if you're using coal, effectively you're using sunshine that fell on the planet thousands of years ago. We have to get into the habit of using today's sunshine today. When you go shopping, try to buy locally. Use farmers markets and local butchers. That reduces the food miles that your, your food has traveled. This way, fewer gallons of fuel are burned, bringing your food to you. And if you buy wood-based products, make sure they come from a well-managed forest. Look for the FSC Tick Tree logo. It's all about being a responsible shopper. And once you start doing this, it just becomes second nature. When you leave the house, why not walk or cycle instead of using a car? Some people use their car like an overcoat. Not only will you feel healthier, but you'll help combat climate change. And if you can't walk or cycle, then use public transport. And filling up public transport makes it more efficient. Empty buses and trains are not exactly carbon friendly. If you do have to use a car, respect the speed limits. In fact, why not drive 10 miles an hour below the speed limit? It adds a bit to your journey, but it uses far less fuel. If you can get an electric vehicle, that'll help greatly, especially if you have solar panels and you get free electricity to drive to work. Similarly, if you're going on holiday, try and go on the train. And if you do have to go by air, then consider paying someone to plant some trees to offset the uh, carbon emissions of your flight. It's not the perfect solution, but it's better than nothing. No matter how much individual effort you put in and the changes that you make, you can always urge others to do more. This begins with your family, your children, your relatives, but also with your elected government representative. Marches such as this are getting across to politicians that the time for climate action is now. But you have got power. The political power, the power of your purse, and of course your personal power. You can do things yourself. You can contribute to the organizations that are fighting climate change. You can help conserve wildlife and keep ecosystems functioning. Draw attention to what needs to be changed and then change it. Worldwide, hundreds of thousands of people are campaigning for climate action. Every one of them has a voice and also the ability to act. You can help by making these personal, individual changes to your lifestyle. You can campaign for legislation and for more people to be sustainable. You can start combating climate change and take climate action now.
Gracias.